smoke yet. Yeah. No, but it's coming. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> so here's our agenda for this, uh, <coughs> this evening's meeting. Um, there will be some announcements with uh, myself and Susan, and then there will be a presentation. And Jack Adam has come from Sandy Flats, Ontario, with Bonnie. Welcome, and uh, Andreas is going to talk about remote DSLR imaging, uh, a system that he has at his on his property as well. He'll give us a little bit of a Starcast update, and he has a special video to show us as well. And then there will be a short intermission. Rick Wagner will give us what's up in the sky. Brian Hunter will give us a short something or other to do with our trip to Chile. Then I'll give a Chile report, and I suppose at that time we could just go around the room and see what people are up to. So welcome everyone, uh, especially new members of the center, if we have any in attendance tonight. Um, on Wednesdays we have Zoom social meetings, which is an opportunity for members to chat and discuss what they're up to. To join an email with the Zoom invitations posted to the center's email list, to get the invitation, you must be set up on the chat list. So if you're not, let me know. Um, we have a newsletter, the uh, Regulus. Regulus is shifting to quarterly, I believe that's confirmed. That's what he said. By sound, but yeah. And uh, it will be found on the website soon, I would say. Um, some, oops, typo. Summer means no regular meetings until September, so that means that July and August there will not be regular meetings. But I, we've been talking about the picnics at Lake Ontario Park. Um, I'm sure that we'll have one or two of those. And something else uh, that uh, will come up, I suppose. Uh, Susan's going to talk about the center bylaws. So, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> would, you like to, would you like to say a word or two? <laughs> yeah, sure. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> because you too have a soft, quiet voice. Uh, so, um, over the last uh, six months or so, uh, your executive has been laboring to uh, reform our bylaws to uh, be in keeping with the new Ontario uh, laws uh, governing charitable organizations. So we've been incorporated as a charity so we can do um, tax receipts for donations and stuff since 2005. And uh, so now uh, we're down to the crunch. We have to have this all completed by uh, sometime in October. So. We're, um, we're down to the final draft, uh, taking out the typos and whatnot, and that'll be ready probably this week, we hope, and um, then uh, you will receive a notice uh, saying that there'll be a special meeting of the membership where we will all have to vote, well, whoever shows up, will have to vote on the, uh, on the bylaws to confirm them. You will receive the bylaws ahead of time, and uh, you're asked if you have comments, uh, get those in in the first uh, the first week that you have the bylaws. Please uh, um, address your concerns with solutions. Uh, no one, after all the work that we put into this, nobody wants to get the notes saying, "Well, I just don't like them." So. <laughs> So if you have a problem, please consider some kind of solution um, because we've, we've been there. And uh, the other thing um, that we will also be asking you to vote on is an update in the Articles of Incorporation. Now that document is not completed yet, but it's a short document. It's like a one page of text that we have to update with uh, the requirements. So that will also be done by the end of the weekend at the latest. And the executive will have a look at that. And then you will be asked to approve those two documents. Um, the bylaws um, uh, will be 
I think it's only like 11 pages, something like that. Anybody remember? Something like that. Anyway, 11 pages and the, um, the Articles of Incorporation update will only be basically a single page that you'll have to read. So watch for that and, uh, and please, please sign in to, it'll be a Zoom meeting for people to vote and uh, yeah, have a look at it uh, and see if there's anything that you want to uh, have input in. Um, and uh, that's it. Okay. Thank you. And that, that Zoom meeting will probably be in July. We hope. And the, the, the deadline, I believe, is October. So we're doing well. It's, it's done. It's not needed to. <laughs> okay. Um, Shelly Jackson, go away. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. I had the original version on the other computer. <laughs> and Chris got it. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it's taken a lot of years for him to realize that. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Malcolm for inviting me to speak in front of you. And what I'm going to talk about, the three things I want to share with you tonight. First of all is the remote imaging, uh, DSR imaging system that I built several years ago. Then a little bit of update on Starfish and also a Northern Lights video. Um, so the whole idea of this remote imaging system came about in uh, a discussion that I had with Dave Dev. And Dave Dev, as you know, is the person who headed up the uh, Starfest imaging contest for many, many years. And one year he approached me and he says, well, what would you do, or how would you uh, take a DSLR camera and be able to rotate it remotely? And I thought about it and I came up with one design uh, which was kind of like the Lord of the Rings, where the camera was sitting inside a big ring and the whole ring rotated. And then later on, I decided, no, that, that really wasn't the best way of doing it, and I came up with another design. But anyway, that prompted me to explore the possibility of how one could physically mount a DSLR camera so that you can rotate the camera for doing imaging. So let me get into it. And I'm sure a lot of people here do astrophotography, and a lot of people use DSLRs and, and, and whatnot. And the way I look at the, for remote imaging, there are really some very uh, important requirements that need to be met to enable you to do remote imaging. First of all, you need to have a go-to-mount go to with the computer interface so that you can control it with the computer. You need to have a digital camera of some sort with a a computer interface, motorized focuser, if you intend to focus the lens on the camera or the telescope, you need to be able to do that remotely. Auto guiding is optional, depending on the length of your exposures. Um, camera rotator is optional, but nice to have. A flat field panel is also optional, um, but again, it's the type of thing that you you do want to have to take your, your flat seat out. You need to be able to turn your uh, equipment on and off remotely. So some way of doing that. Equipment enclosure that can be opened and closed remotely. Cloud sensor, so you can see what's going on. Because if you're sitting inside your living room, it could be clouding you out outside. And unless you stick your head out to have a look at it, uh, if you don't have a cloud sensor, you won't know that. Some sort of 
master control software that integrates all the equipment that you've accumulated together. And Nina is one of those. Seeking Generator Pro is another one. Um, there's also other software available that you can use for that. And then the ability to see what's visually happening with your equipment. Again, if you're sitting in the living room watching a football game or a hockey game on TV <laughs> and you've got your equipment outside, uh, you may want to check on it every now and then just to see that it's doing what you think it's doing or should be doing. And then the other thing that you need is lots and lots of patience. And as you can see, my hair is getting thin. <laughs> so uh, that's a result of this and many other projects that uh, I've been engaged in terms of imaging and remote imaging and things of that nature. Now, I look at remote imaging in three states. If you're going to do it, it's sort of three steps that you have to go to on site, where you set up your equipment and you're physically outside with your equipment sitting next to it and you're running it using your computer. And that's a very important stage to go through because that will acquaint you with how the computer interacts with the equipment and the different noises that make <laughs> that the equipment makes. Um, and also if you run into any problems, you can address them right away, there, immediately. So the, the, the on-site stage is basically you want to verify the the basic operation of the equipment to make sure that it's 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 working correctly and the sequence of commands that you give to the system are are responding the way you think they should and you're getting the results that you want. Once you're happy with that, then you go to what I call local remote where you are in your living room or kitchen table or wherever. And the equipment is outside a short distance away. So if, if anything goes goes wrong you can always go out and fix it. However what you really need to do at this stage is not go out and physically fix it. It's to try and solve the problem using your computer. Is there a way that I can I can I can I can, I can resolve this problem and fix it? Address any issues that should occur without going outside. Cloud sensor is required to monitor weather conditions, and you need to establish an automated and tested automatic emergency shutdown, shutdown procedure. It can cloud over and it can start raining. So you need to make sure that the, whatever system you put in place can address that so that if it starts to rain, it will automatically close the system. And then finally, once you're comfortable with the local remote, then you can move to the situation where you are physically miles away from where um, the uh, equipment is located and you can control the building internet. So those are the three phases that, that, that uh, we have. So here it is, it's just sort of a summary of the, the uh, equipment that I have uh, put together. This is the GATA mount GE120, which is kind of a Osmandi G11 knockoff. Um, I have a machine shop in my basement. Um, and so I basically uh, built this mount from scratch. Um, I usually, the, the mechanics are pretty easy, it's the electronics that always um, bother me. And so in terms of the actual um, hardware, the motors and the software for controlling the motors, the, the telescope, uh, came from Astro Instruments and they did, um, back in the 90s, they had the Skywalker servo, which was a replacement for the synchronous motors. And so that's that's the, uh, the hardware aspect of it that it use. And it also has a software called Maestro which controls the, um, the stepper motors. Um, the next thing that you want to do, uh, at least I decided that I wanted to do, is to um, allow the camera to be rotated remotely so that I could frame my shot the way that I wanted it. And so I call this the Borg DSLR camera rotator and focuser. And I'll describe it in a bit more detail so that you can understand sort of what, what's gone into it. First thing that I had to do is I had to come up with a way of being able to control a couple of step motors. And there is a uh, company in Spain called Lumitica Astronomica, and they make some um, products for controlling uh, devices. 
I bought the Amadillo, which allows me to control two devices, such as the focus motor, such as the camera rotation. We have another box, a little more expensive, which allows you to control three devices. I, I, just, I just went for the two. And then the next thing I had to do is I had to arrange for stepper motors. So I got two different types of stepper motors. I got a, just a, a rotational stepper motor and a linear stepper motor. And the linear stepper motor, this piston, moves in and out. And this one also rotates. So here's what it looks like when it's all put together. So stepper motor is attached to a, a base plate and that attaches an angle bracket camera is attached to the angle bracket and because this thing rotates, the camera will end up rotating with, with the angle bracket. This uh, device here is the focus mechanism and what it consists of is basically it's a split ring which is spring loaded to, to compress around the, the focus uh, knob on the motor. There is a, a little piston up, there's a little uh, arm out here and then that linear stepper motor pushes up against that arm. And so as it moves up and down, it winds up rotating the focus back and forth, a small amount. Here's a side view, so you can, you can actually see the, uh, the, the arm, the spring, and then the stepper motor mount there. You can see the L bracket up here. Another rotation, you can see the bottom of the L bracket. What bears the load? Hmm? Where's the load? The load? What bears the load? The stepper motor itself. It's a geared stepper motor. So the whole camera is hanging off the stepper motor? Yeah. And also, okay, let me let me go back. Let me go back. Um, so another thing that I had to do. The other thing that you wind up seeing here, you see this little block block here. That's a del ring. Del ring ring that sits and provides friction on the pivot point, which holds the weight of the camera in every position. It's friction. The strength of the stepper motor can overcome that friction through the rotation. So, but that whole camera <laughs> is hanging off of the, the motor. Right. Actually, not not directly off the motor. There's a bearing in between oh, okay. with a with a half inch uh, bit shaft. Ah, okay. <coughs> so there, there, you don't see it in here, but physically inside here, there is a uh, half inch uh, uh, ball bearing oh, that, okay. that that takes the weight, and so the, all that the motor does does basically does does the rotation. That makes sense. Yes. No. <laughs> okay. And why do you want to rot be able to rotate the camera? Well, this is one shot the way it would normally be, and the rotation I want to put it through 90 degrees or whatever angle that I want to frame the shot the way I want it. Okay, um, we all know about darks and flats and why you need them and why you should be able to do them. Um, and the other the other key thing that I want to point out about darks and flats is that quite often with a DSLR and when you're doing, doing uh, exposures, they're usually very long exposures, 30 seconds, 2 minutes, whatever, whatever it is. However, when you're doing flats, it's usually sub-second. So you need the ability to switch back and forth between bulb mode, which on mechanic cameras is a mechanical process, and manual mode to give you the, the subset of exposures. So when you when you wind up uh, um, trying to run your, your system remotely, everything has to be done in bulb mode. So that has some implications on, on what you do <coughs> to create darks and flats. And so here are some options that are available to you. Um, and these prices are probably a couple of years out of date now. Um, you can get, you can go commercial, and you can get the Optic uh, uh, flip flap for 560 US uh, dollars. It's a great product, by the way. Um, we use it in uh, our clubs observatory. You can use this uh, Pegasus thing, 
um, but it's basically a manual on and off. Of course, this is completely automatically controlled. Deep Sky Daddy is another uh, company that I found in Europe that uh, generates that for 250 euros, which isn't bad. Or you could do it yourself using an aluminum gold clamp for 47.99 US. And um, it's it's a pretty reasonable. It's for a five inch diameter, so it's a good good size uh, piece of. Uh, so I'm going to build what I call the air seaboat flat panel. Maybe you'll understand that in a minute. So here's the aluminum gold. Here's the back of the cell. Here's the front of the cell. Power supply, diffuser, and then what I wound up inserting in between the um, the diffuser. Actually, I put it on top of the diffuser. Is neutral density filters because I found that the intensity was too bright, and what I needed to do is get it down to the point where, like a one to three second exposure, it gave me the correct illumination for the flat fields. So. Then there were some other things that, that, that I had to buy. Uh, for example, a power converter to keep control was down to 9 volts because the, the uh, light source of current 9 volts. My neutral density filters, uh, elastic bungee cords, and EOP. All of this, by the way, came from Amazon. <laughs> um, try and source it locally, forget it. Amazon is the way to go. So here's what it looks like put together. So the light panel, the um, the um, diffuser, and the neutral density filter is suspended on four points, which is why I call it the air seal flat panel, on the north side of the roof. So that when it closes, that presses against the front of the uh, camera lens. And there's a new ring on here to ensure a tight tight seal. And you can see it closing, and it actually closed. Now this has two two, two things that it does. Number one, because it's making direct contact, it allows me to do my dark frames. Turn on the light, I can do my flats. And here's what the flat panel looks like, and you can see got a little dust bin right there, and some kind of lantern reflection there. Next thing is you need to have uh, some kind of enclosure um, to store the equipment. If you don't want to be taking it in and out every day, that's, that's kind of defeats the whole purpose of it. So again, uh, I looked around to see what was available commercially, and I found that um, um, there was a company the States makes dive control panel and interactive astronomy is the name of the company and they provided already everything that you needed. It's designed for a roll-off roof but it can be easily adapted to what I was doing. And so they provide you with basically this control system software to control this and then the permit switches that you need for Getting it in. And then the other thing that I needed to do is I needed some way of being able to reverse the polarity so this again came off the internet. And this uh, linear track actuator uh, was imported from China. It's about uh, foot uh, travel. And what it's used for normally, it's used for inside those motorized reclining chairs where the seat comes up to help you get out of bed <laughs> on the chair. <coughs> Uh, 4,000 newtons, of course, it's, it's made of that, so I figured that should handle it without any trouble. And here's the actual enclosure. Um, I prototyped it in my basement, and what it, it consists of, and we'll sort of go through this in a little bit of detail, there's a couple of uh, uh, large pulleys, on each, one on each side, and there's a uh, wire cable that goes over that pulley goes around these pulleys and attaches to the track actuator. So here you can see the two pulleys. Here you can see the, uh, the, the track actuator there and you've got two cables. So it's under constant tension. Those wires are under constant tension. 
So you can move the track battery in one way, it opens it. You can move the track battery in the other direction, it closes. And then you've got your limit switches. So here is that limit switch right there. And the other one, here's another shot. And then there's a third switch over here, which is used to indicate the park position of the telescope. Because in order for the roof to be open or closed, the telescope has to be in the park position. We also don't do that. So there's a magnetic, uh, magnetic uh, uh, switch in here, lead switch in here. And uh, once the telescope is parked, it will enable the roof to open and close. And here you can sort of see, this is, this is a really version, a small magnet in the air. Uh, since this photograph is done, I've increased the size of this magnet made it more powerful because I found that quite often it wouldn't, wouldn't find the, uh, the park position. And so that's sort of the, the building in a, in, a, in a kind of nutshell. And then the other thing that you need is a cloud sensor. And the one that I chose to use is the AAG Cloud Watcher, again from the uh, Pro Astronomica. And it, it basically represents a couple of different charts. The key one that you base it in is the obviously the clear chart. Um, it can also detect rain, and it also has the capability of providing a safe or unsafe condition for termination of the imaging session and for automatic closing of the roof. The here's what it all looks like. Um, in, in, again, in a nutshell, um, here's the building. It's basically three by three square by about three feet high and the roof is about four and a half feet high. The telescope just sort of shoehorns inside the building, um, which makes it a little bit difficult to work on. <laughs> but I do have the side panel that opens up. And then to see what's going on inside, I used a Logitech quick cam orbit camera. And here's a view from the inside. The other thing that you can sort of see around here is this sort of black and white uh, things in here, which is strip lighting. Again, from Amazon, and I turn that on and off um, so I can see what's going on. And the other thing that I've done, which doesn't show so much in here, I've also put visual, visual indicators showing the park position. So that when I turn on the camera, I can I can visually look at this and say, yeah, it, it is it is really in the park position. It's just a matter of a piece of tape. And when two pieces of tape are aligned, you know, you know you're, you're, you're park. Um, the remote switch. There's a company that I deal with from Bulgaria called Benkovi. <laughs> they make home automation stuff. And so you can buy relay boards from them uh, for a 1632 relays on, on the board. And then uh, you can control it through their, their software, which they provide. But the thing that really um, intrigued me when I first discovered this, uh, this, this company was they also have a command line interface. So you can issue a command which you can run through ASCOM compliant programs. So that allows you to automate command to open up the shutter, command to, to turn on the power, and so on and so forth. It allows you to do that. Um, my first use of this, just, just, just as, a, as an aside, was in uh, 19, uh, 2017 um, for the solar eclipse. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to automate the removal of the solar filter. So I, I can use a, a very simple linear actuator which basically flipped it to 90 degrees and I use this for controlling it through software. And it worked great. Um, obviously there's going to be a lot of electronics. A computer to control it, Skyroof controller, um, the power power reversing switch for the for the track actuator. You also want to be able to do it manually. So it's in parallel. There's a, there's a manual switch, two position switch, three position switch actually. 
there is a USB hub, um, a, another USB hub which allows you to uh, actually activate, deactivate USB hubs and USB devices. It is sometimes you lose connectivity and even a way that you can fix the connectivity is to recycle the USB. And this allows you to, on a port by port basis, allows you to do that. The code relay card, board, camera power supply, flat panel power supply. So all this stuff is basically you know, on one side of the, of the building. And this is where I also have the cover that I can open up to access. In terms of software, and I'm not going to get into a detailed discussion of the software, but I'm using the Skyroof control panel software, the Celtic uh, software, the Benkovi software, Cart Cell, um, PhD2, Maestro, Mina, and of course ASCOM. So that's sort of the software suite that works together to allow me to automate the, the learning section. So what I can do, I can set up my imaging run for the night, I can press start, it goes away, it doesn't stay, and then again, it closes down. <coughs> and here's what it looks like. <coughs> um, well, I'll just, just go through it very quickly. Uh, just a short video showing you know, how it opens, how it closes, how the telescope moves. See the other lighting switches here, one is here, and one is down, down here. Oh. And then you know, the park sensor. Manual DSLR camera rotators. I've seen I've seen a couple out there, but no, nah, you don't want to do it manually. And the real trick that I found, the real real challenge I found, was trying to figure out how to get all the cabling cabling done. That's why I refer to this as the board. You remember, the board had all these tubes coming out of their, their, their bodies. Could have heard a little, so it could have. That's 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 the software basically indicating that certain actions have happened and that they're they're about to begin something else. <clears throat> and that's about it. Are there any questions? You like that, do you? How many outbuildings do you have on your property? <laughs> uh, this one, this is, this is at Sandy Flats. Um, no, this is the only one. Okay, because I know we have about eight. And every time a project like this comes along, that makes nine. That makes <laughs> ten. That, makes, <laughs> that is amazing, Andre. Wow. I, uh, just, wow. Andreas, why did you use a DSLR as opposed to a, um, a, a dedicated astro camera, which would have been 
relatively easy to go ahead and rotate? He ne the answer is he never does anything easily. Perfectly <laughs> 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 valid. No, the question goes back to the original um, question that Dave Beck posed to me. How would you rotate the PS1 camera? And so I based everything around that uh, around that assumption that you wanted to use a PS1 camera. Okay. So, 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 so be careful. Yeah, that's that's the answer is. <laughs> no, so because fair enough, because it makes it makes the flats that you have, yeah. since the camera never rotates in rotation to the lens, your flats are always good. Yeah. Whereas if you rotate the camera, I understand you'd have to take yeah. a different flat for, for yeah. each time you went ahead and rotated for, yeah. for each of the things that you were doing. But but that seems to me to be an easier thing to do than to to go ahead and have. What well, looks like to be a, like a 10 pound lens hanging from a relatively small bearing. Yeah, but it's 10 pounds, it's, that's still not an uh, ornamental load. Okay. So, uh, any other questions? Question. Yeah. How do you change from bulb to manual? You don't. Okay. <laughs> Everything is in bulb. So, okay. so basically, what you want to do is to do, to do your to do your, uh, your flat fields is you expose it, because I have the neutral density filters in there. I, had to, I, had, I can't remember what it was, it was nine, I think nine, nine stops, and it was, was quite, a, quite a significant number, um, to get it down to the point where it would be within the one, one to three second range. Um, any exposure shorter than one second on bulb is not reliable. So you want to you want to make sure that you're in you're in that range. Wow. So that's why I got around the problem of having having to change. Any, any other questions? Well, we'll keep the lights out and all the other. They uh, <laughs> <well>, uh, <laughs> have cats. Why do have kitty? Mice have <laughs> been a problem. Ants have. Uh, one year, there was an ant nest that built itself in the in the lens, but. And I had to look them, but it's been pretty good. This is still a temporary um, structure. Still, the bottom is still sort of um, uh, white tarpaulin, white poly tarp. And it was quick and easy for me to put together. The, the key thing here was the, was the roof, designing the roof. And I, I made that out of steel. And one of the questions uh, that I always considered when I did my, my testing what's the snow going to be like if the snow falls? And, and I, I went to the line, and of course there was a table for depending on what kind of snow it was, like bucky snow or wet snow or icy <laughs> slush, sloshy snow. So I wound up uh, in my stress testing and put 100 pounds on the top of the roof and it still managed it. So anyway, okay. So that's that's it, unless there's any other, other further questions, I'm gonna end this right. And what I'd like to do next is talk a little bit about Starfest. Can you log into it now, or is it internet able, or is it still just remote from the house? Right now, it's taken apart. No! <laughs> the reason it was taken apart is I needed the camera to go down to um, Texas for the eclipse, and so I haven't gotten around to putting it back together yet. <laughs> anyway, um, so. I'd like to talk a little bit about Starfest. Um, and you know that's that's coming up, and just give you some of the highlights as to what we've got planned for this year. Um, the theme for this year is strange new worlds, and it's based on the fact that we've been getting all these wonderful images in from the James West Space Telescope about the discoveries made not only in deep space but also in the exoplanets and so we decided that that might be appropriate as a theme and that we would get some of our uh, key speakers to talk about the various discoveries that have been made recently. So our our keynote Saturday night Terry Dickinson Memorial speaker this year will be Sarah Seeger and she will be talking about uh, planetary atmospheres and the suits for science and life beyond the Earth so it should be quite a, quite a uh, fascinating talk. Uh, last year, we dedicated our Saturday night talk in the memory of in Terry's memory. 
Uh, then the other keynote speakers that we have on Friday night are Dr. Mike Daly, who will be talking about uh, so Asteroid Benin. Benin! Do you like that? We counted yeah. rocks. We counted, we counted rocks. so many rocks. <laughs> so many rocks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Dr. Ellis. Post traumatic stress. Uh, features illuminating the mind of the JW Space Telescope. So those are our keynotes. In addition to those keynotes, we have a whole bunch of other people talking about various different things that will hopefully be of interest. And usually what we wind up doing is when we, when we plan these, we plan our, our, our program, is we go around the room, and since we're all amateur astronomers in the room, we're to the Ukraine. What can we do on this? So on and so on. So we've, we've, tried, we've tried to... To build a, a fairly um, uh, program that is a solo cabin. There's something there Maybe. for everyone. So anyway, that's that. There also will be a solar eclipse panel discussion. I know how many people actually saw the eclipse. Oh, good. <laughs> how many didn't? Bonnie <laughs> <laughs> didn't, unfortunately. Oh, sorry. Uh, but anyway, so we're going to sort of do a little. Coast to coast wrap up on, on uh, what uh, what we saw and where we saw it from and our adventures to get there. Imaging contest is going to be uh, happening again this year. Uh, uh, Malcolm is actually going to be uh, organizing it this year. He's been sabbatical for a year, and uh, we've got two types of prizes. There's the Dave Dev prizes. You want to get some nice custom made. Wooden telescopes, cameras, and there. And then Skywatcher, it's probably going to be donating about another $10,000 worth of prizes. Images. So, um, if you're interested, the deadline is July the 6th. And these are the categories time lapse video, astro, star, trail, and landscaping, solar system, clips photos, and then deep sky objects. So that's that's the, uh, the imaging contest. And that's it. That's all I've got to say. Any wow. questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. How do people register for Starfish? How do people register for Starfish? You go online to the NYAA website, you click on Starfest, and then there's a, a link to, to uh, register. I never did say that, did I? <laughs> Okay, and the last thing I thought I would do is, I know all of you um, heard about the Northern Lights display on May 9th, 10th. And so what I'd like to do is share, you, share with you what, uh, what I saw. They're going to our house. <laughs>
How did you not have cloud? We had cloud. Oh my goodness. Well, <laughs> it, 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 what wound up happening is I knew the northern lights was going to come. I knew it was cloudy outside. And at around 10 o'clock, I decided that I would go out with the camera and just take a shot, just to, just to, to, to see what was going on. It was completely red. Wow. So I said, said to myself, well, I think I'm going to get my ass out there and get the cameras going. <laughs> so um, it started off um, cloudy. And I just set the north, north camera up first. And, <laughs> and then after I got that one going, I set up the east camera and then south camera. And it just, it just I got lucky. That's all yeah. it is. Just, just <coughs> pure luck. Wow. Beautiful. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So I'll leave it at that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing, amazing work on the observatory. Amazing machining. I've been in his shop. It's <laughs> like he's built stuff for me, and it's just the workmanship is unbelievable. I really appreciate everything that you've done. Thank you so much. I appreciate you coming as well. No problem. And that, uh, that Aurora, I've got Aurora video. Sure. Okay. <laughs> it's not as good as that. But it's uh, it's funny. That's that's uh, that's where I first saw you. No, I just, just tapped on the bedroom window and so well, thank, you. thank you very much. It's just yeah. white waves yeah, up to the center. Uh, let's take five. <laughs> And uh, we'll, we'll come back and uh, Rick will give us the what's up. I couldn't see the questions. Yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what I was going to say. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
well, it's probably be like a strip of sky. And within that strip, there are, you know, these 75 galaxies that are likely to contain the supernova. And so we can start imaging and actually catch it before it comes visible. So they're going to do a campaign update on Saturday. Um, they've started uh, doing little updates on the various observing sections. On the 22nd, we have cataclysmic variables, the AAVSO's network of uh, remotely controlled telescopes, to which, if you're a member, you can submit observing requests. The short period pulsators, yeah. Um, on the 29th, the spectroscopy group, the high energy uh, physics group, and uh, photoelectric photometry. Uh, on the 13th, they will have their normal how-to webinar, and again on the 10th. I'm go running through stuff until August, because we aren't having any more meetings until September. Uh, Lennox and Addington uh, having a whole bunch of stuff up close with the moon on the 15th of June, 27th of July, 24th of August. Uh, laser guided tours, they seem to do those on pairs of night, both Friday and Saturday night. And the astrophotographers assemble and you can get out there and, and uh, do imaging and uh, have your laptop screens uh, blinding everybody and so forth. North Frontenac, uh, observing sessions on the 12th and 13th of July uh, for the Perseids in August. Uh, for some reason they've got two following weekends uh, in August. And then the Festival of Stars, three days in September. Uh, I don't think you're allowed to camp there in spite of the fact that it being a three-day event. So I guess you go up and back or something or, or stay in the area. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, that's my fault. Uh, anyway, uh, you can see that... Uh, for those people on the dark side, there's not much there. And the, you know, the good people doing solar, there's lots of uh, lots of time. Events in the sky, uh, 13th, Lunar X is visible on the Terminator. That's tomorrow. Tomorrow. Uh, first quarter moon on the 14th. Lunar straight wall also on the 14th. Solar solstice on the 20th at uh, 4.51 in the afternoon. Summer officially begins. Maybe it'll warm up a little. Uh, full moon on the 21st, uh, last quarter on the 28th. Not much happening in June. Uh, some highlights in July. We are at Aphelion on the 5th. Uh, big one, 13th of July. Uh, the moon is going to occult Spica. Unfortunately, it's like 10 or 15 degrees or something above the western horizon. So, uh, kind of low. But on the other hand, the moon's pretty bright. Spike is pretty bright. So, it should be, uh, should be easy enough. Uh, south Delta Aquarius meteors peak on the 30th or so. It's a very broad shadow or a broad, broad peak. So, you can see them sort of any time around then. In fact, they even say that you can probably see some Perseids if you're out watching for the, the SDAs. Uh, double shadows, a whole bunch of double shadow, double moon transits. So there's going to be four things on, on the disk of Jupiter, uh, which will be very cool. Uh, August, uh, another double shadow transit. Perseids, of course, in August. Um, uh, I think it's a pretty good year this year. I think the moon's setting by like 11. So, you know, they're best after midnight anyway. So, should be a good night for those. What else? Major planets. Uh, not a lot of activity, uh, especially if you don't like getting up in the mornings. Uh, Venus is, is coming in, has come into the evening sky, but it's very low. Uh, in the evening sky. Mercury's quite low, although by the end of the summer, or I think in July, it, it has the greatest elongation east and then starts going back down. So, uh, Saturn uh, is already well up in the southeast uh, by morning twilight and by the end of summer, I think in early September, mid-September, it's at opposition already. So, it's going to be improving and, and certainly worth looking at. 
Uh, Neptune also well up in the southeast at morning twilight. Mars, um, because Mars is closer to us, it's still moving around the sun at a pretty good rate of knots, and so we aren't catching up to it very fast. So it's, you know, it is getting higher in the sky in the morning, but uh, not, uh, not very quickly. But by September, sort of, it'll be uh, pretty good. Uranus, uh, low in the east in the morning twilight, and Jupiter uh, rises during morning twilight. It'll be a while before Jupiter is very exciting. Small bodies, another interesting thing. Moon occult series on the 23rd. Uh, I've never watched a large, I mean, Ceres is kind of cool because it's the only dwarf planet that you're easily going to see anymore. Pluto is now like magnitude 14.4 or something. Easy to image, but not so easy to see. Uh, and only a, two weeks later or so, Ceres is at opposition, so it's, uh, it's nice and bright. The other dwarf planet you can see is Pluto, which is at opposition on the 23rd of July. It's a hard one to find. That's all I've got. Yes, questions? Um, yeah. Um, I... Yeah? I don't remember when it was, though. When it was or when it's going to be. So... Yeah, that would be something that might be interesting to image. It's not terribly close, but I think if you have a sort of a whitish, yeah. So uh, remind us what the new name of the North Frontenac Deep Sky Preserve is. It's the North Frontenac Astronomy Park. Okay, thank you. June twenty fourth, twenty fifth. Oh, okay. So if you're Doing like I do and imaging T core bore, it'll be worth uh, taking it, especially that night. It about a quarter of a degree from the return oh, there you go. All right. So we'll have uh, all sorts of pictures at the <laughs> September meeting. Thank you. Is that something going by T core? Uh, the asteroid Pallas at about like seventh magnitude or something. At night? Yeah. We... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, moving right along. Thank you for that, Rick. Um, there were um, a couple of intrepid adventurers went uh, to the southern hemisphere recently. One of them, your host, the other on his way to the podium as we speak, Brian Hunter, welcome. You have a little bit of a report on our trip. Yeah, I, I, will, I will keep this short. I will keep this short. And he brought his sippy cup with him. <laughs> he brought his sippy cup with him. Well, I'll tell you what that <laughs> is in a second. Um, I, I have to tell the story on myself. Uh, this trip was a bit of an adventure. Um, I, I had, I had, I had thought my main role was I was going to be the guy who would be extra pair of hands. It, when you're putting telescopes on mounts and stuff, you need an extra pair of hands, and that was that was me. But I also discovered I was the lightning rod because it was the trip that, in terms of being searched, everything went wrong. Everything went wrong. Sorry, we, we flew to tell you that it was a bit of a journey because Air Canada has stopped flying non-stop from Toronto to Santiago. And so you've got to stop somewhere. And we chose to stop in Bogota, Colombia. We flew Air Canada to Bogota and Avianca to Santiago, so Montreal. Uh, I had made a gadget. As you know, I'm a, I'm a tinkerer and I make things. And what I had made was a little adapter to put on the end of my star adventurer so that I could have a light emitting diode illuminating the reticle. And you don't want it on all the time, so you have a push button. 
turn it on. Okay? So I had this, this gadget, okay? and it consisted of a little plastic thing with a light emitting diode in it and wire running down to a little circuit board that had on it a, a bit of electronics, a potentiometer, a re variable resistor, and a red button <laughs> and a battery. Okay? Well, security saw the wire running between two things. And you can almost guess the rest. They interpreted this as being the detonator for a bomb. And they didn't like it at all. <laughs> You're not taking that on the plane. You're not taking that. They confiscated it. Okay, so that that was the first one. <laughs> the next step is when you change flights in Bogota, you have to go through security again. It's, it's it's kind of an odd arrangement to change planes, even international to international. You have to go through security again. So I walk up to security with my my rollerboard, and the hook comes out. And I get dragged out again, and they went through my bag. I don't know what was in my bag that they didn't like. So that was okay. We then got to Santiago, and Chile x-rays all incoming luggage because they're looking for things like fruit and vegetables. Because you're not allowed, as Malcolm found out on one trip, you're not allowed to take fruit and vegetables into Chile because they're protecting their industry. And I didn't know this, but if they don't like what they see in your bag, they put a blue tag on the end of the airline's truck sticker, okay? So again, the hook comes up, and I get hauled out again. You should have seen Malcolm scuttling out of the way because he's got thousands of dollars worth of astronomy cameras in his bag that he intends to leave in Chile. Okay. I, didn't, I didn't think I had anything. I think what they really didn't like was my tools, because they thought I was coming to work. So Malcolm scurried out of the way, and he will admit he scurried out of the way, and I got hooked again. Finally, one more time, we're now going to fly to Calama from Santiago, and I got hooked out again, because I have a little plastic container with a bunch of batteries in it that look like bullets. <laughs> How would I go again? So it's four times. <laughs> the return wasn't that bad. And, and Mal Malcolm was well. laughing at me the whole time. Anyway, yes. um, I'm not going to tell a story on Malcolm, and you're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe this. One of the things Malcolm did when we were in Chile was borrowed a pair of astronomical binoculars, and he actually looked through them. No! Can you imagine <laughs> that? Malcolm actually observing and liked it. I like it. I'm yeah. loving it. Now, um, one quick story about something I made. The Star Adventure has a counterweight, which has a mass of a kilogram. Now, if you're traveling by air, Putting a kilogram of steel in your bag is really a bit of a waste. Okay, how do I turn this back on? Wait, let's wait. Okay. Now it's connected to the wire. It is a bomb. <laughs> so what I did was I found online a 3D printed counterweight. And what you do is you fill it with rocks. And you screw it back together. Or it's okay. Coca <laughs> <laughs> leaves. And it was made for a 15 millimeter shaft. And the shaft of the Star Adventure is smaller, so I made a little sleeve that fits inside. Whoops. Somehow it goes inside. Uh oh, you broke it. I broke it. Yeah, well, anyway, this goes inside. Okay. And then the whole thing, and it's got a slot cut in it. Or, Machine made into it, so it clamps on this. Thing. So if you ever need a lightweight counterweight, there's a lightweight counterweight. Now, finally, one of the reasons for going to San Pedro is the place we stay is run by a guy by the name of Alain Mori. And Alain's a wonderful guy. He's just an all-around wonderful guy. And his pride and joy is this beast. It, this is a 1.15 meter Dobsonian telescope. It's the largest telescope, visual telescope, publicly available in 
the southern hemisphere and maybe in the world. Okay? And I'm going to let Malcolm tell you what we saw with this thing. But this is a picture Alan took. And this down here is the aurora that you photograph from the southern hemisphere. And in fact, from very close to the Tropic of Capricorn. In San Pedro is at 23 degrees south. It's really quite remarkable because the maximum of the aurora australis would actually be on the other side of the world. Okay? Because the southern magnetic, south magnetic pole is actually on the other side of the earth. And yet, you can still see the aurora. And, and I hope Malcolm will show you his time lapse that shows the aurora from, from mm -hmm. San Pedro. It, you, we couldn't see it visually, but, but photographically, it was there. And I think Malcolm will take you on a bit of a tour of some of the things that we observed with Alain through this telescope. It, it is, I think, F4. 3.75. 3.75, but it's got a paracor in it. So I think it's actually closer to F4 after you look through the paracor. And we were operating at magnifications of between 300 and 400. Focal and length is 4.3 meters. Yeah. The, the, the things you can see <clears> through <throat> this telescope will knock your socks off. And I leave it to Mel. Now, carry on. Okay. Um, yeah. <coughs> it's just the most amazing instrument that you can run through. And I'm not a paid spokesman for oops. Uh, but I, sh you know, always, if you get a chance, I mean, I can't, I can't tell you, you've got to go this, to this place. It's just unbelievable. But anyway, um, what I'd like to do is to give you a report on our observatory, which is called the Atacama Backyard Observatory. And you might wonder why they call it that. And, the explanation is uh, Guillaume Rochon, Rochon uh, is, uh, he's here with us, he's over in the back left corner. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, welcome to our dinner. Uh, uh, Guillaume is the author of Backyard EOS and Ooh. Backyard Nikon. So if any of you use a DSLR connected to your computer and have used Backyard EOS, um, and if you have any questions, keep your man. <laughs> but uh, looking for a name, I was thinking it just came to me. Backyard uh, should be in the name because of his uh, his software. So the Atacama Backyard Observatory was born, and that's that's where that came from. This is um, a view from the All Sky camera that is installed at the base of the tripod, and uh, this is the desktop image on uh, the computer in Chile. And just for a sense of scale, the, uh, the observatory is uh, at the red dot at the bottom, which is many thousands of kilometers and hours of travel. I think it was 30 something hours. Anyway, the beauty of it is it's it, at this time of year, at least it's the same time zone. So you, you endure the travel and then there's no jet lag because there are no time zones to cross. So it's a very, very amazing thing that you could do that, as opposed to people who have uh, been to Australia to do the same thing. And, you know, there's uh, 12 hours of time difference or whatever. Uh, uh, this is a photograph of the uh, area where uh, the observatories are with the volcano in the background called Lihan uh, Tabur. And this is the original setup. So it's the, the 10 mi micron GM2000 mount, which is a very, like it's the best mount I've ever had the uh, good fortune of, of using. Um, and it's, it's right up there with the top mounts from around the world. Uh, Amazing weight capacity and accuracy and, and absolute encoders and you uh, name The Tech 140 refractor at F7 with a Tech Field flattener, a Moravian CCD camera, which
which is getting a little long in the tooth. And it's the 16803 version of the SPIC sensor. Or no, SPIC sensor? No, not SPIC. Codon. Codon, thank you. <laughs> and um, so it's a square sensor. Um, square filter, 50 millimeter square filters. Lots of accessories. Um, I did a time lapse from the base. Interesting statistics, amazing statistics, really. Uh, we've been there for five years now. We, we went down in 2019. Brian, Ilan, myself, we went down. Then we decided we'd change things a little bit. We went back, except uh, Ilan couldn't go the next time, so Brian and I went back. And we, uh, we did a little bit of uh, updating, but 200 to 220 nights of imaging per year. 3,655 hours of over five hours. We got an MPC observing group observatory code uh, last year and we submitted hundreds of observations of asteroids. Uh, the data, I, I don't even know how many terabytes, I guess, of data we have. I don't know. And we got one APOD on uh, December 31. Um, this is the view a day or two after the James Webb Space Telescope launch, and that is the telescope on its way to Lagrange Point 2 as it went through Orion. Hmm. The, uh, the, the, the decision to upgrade was easy because after this amount of time, the easy targets were mostly used and it was getting repetitive. So to avoid being repetitive, I started doing more mosaics. But the CCD was, you know, getting long in the tooth and CMOS cameras beckoned and, you know, I had some telescopes at home, longer focal length. Long story short, uh, Ilan and I talked and agreed this would, uh, this would happen. And so it was a question of what telescope to send down. And, you know, we need to shoot a new field of view. Uh, but wait, why send just one? Um, we could shoot two new fields of view. And so the telescopes I had on hand, I had a 12 inch Ritchie Kretschmann, which was a, you know, this, I think most of you heard the story of my collimation, trials and tribulations. And then I had an inch nine and a quarter. And then I considered a Roken on 135 as well. And I eliminated the Richie Christian because of its difficulty in collimation. And I selected the edge, but I had a nine and a quarter and I, I really wanted more aperture. And coincidentally at that time, I had this conversation with Marquet. And Marquet and I talked about it and we came to a, an agreement on, on swapping our, our OTAs. And so now I had an 11 inch and the final decision was easy, and um, that that really was, you know, the the, the the biggest step was. Now we looked at the uh, the logistics of getting the scope to Chile. Um, I was testing the scope. I decided this scope should be cleaned and collimated at Celestron, which they have a service for it, and it was a great choice because it came back, the optics were pristine and um, columned, beautifully columned. And 
so around this time, I think uh, sometime in the winter, I can't remember exactly, I asked Brian, are you up for another trip? Because Gillan did not make it on this trip, and um, Brian agreed to join me. Um, there were many new pieces of gear needed. I needed a new lens, the Rokinon 135. I needed cameras, I needed filter wheels, I needed a way to control the focus on the broken on, so I got a ring set, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It all sounds really expensive. And then I, I had a conversation with Alain, and he said, what are you going to do with your Tech 140? I said, I don't know. I was going to bring it back home and maybe sell it. He goes, I've got somebody here that wants to buy it. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and that, uh, that, that funded the, the, the new equipment. So I really didn't have to do much. I, I just, uh, while I was down there, I, 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 I I'll say unmounted, or dismounted the, uh, the Tech 140. Alain took over, and, uh, and it will be about uh, 10 feet to the east of my setup, because the new owner is, is on the pier right beside me. So that's kind of interesting. But I did find that uh, with the, um, the edge, when I introduced the edge reducer, that introduced coma, and that is not supposed to happen. And you know, the, uh, the, the reducer is supposed to have the same back focus as without. And all I have to do, as I understand it, is put it in the imaging train and it should be fine, but it wasn't. So I decided to shoot it F10 anyway and part of the reason for that is we have these amazing deconvolution tools now. so i shipped it off to chile it took about two weeks to get there no major issues and uh, we went down to, the main to set it up just to give you an idea of the fields of view that we're talking about in these two examples i've got a large target and small target and there are three Three, um, one square and, and two rectangles representing the fields of view. Of, in purple, you'll see the CPC 1100 and ASI 2600. And that's the Edge HD. And the blue square is the old Tech 140. And the 135 millimeter is the other one. And you can see that the Tech was really not suitable for either of these. This is an example, right? There are lots of targets to choose from, but in a lot of the case, the tech either was too small a field of view or too large a field of view. So now we're uh, in in sort of a, a special range where we can get the, the deep, the long focal length items and the wide field items. And this is what it looks like set up. It's a <coughs> saddle plate on the uh, 10 micron mount. It has 11 inch edge HD with a, um, oh, the Italian Primalus Labs. Um, it's a flat panel and a motor on the top that will open the flat panel all the way, a full 270 degrees, so it's flat against the red rail on the top. And then in front of that, you can see the broken on 135 in the rings with a camera, filter wheel, uh, focuser, and flat pack. So, and then just a, another word on some of the, the uh, verbiage in this. I, I took from um, searching on and, and some of the Cloudy Nights posts that I saw and some of the... Um, forums post that I saw. So if the optics are good and the seeing is perfect, then the size of the area pattern in microns depends on wavelength and F number. And I would be I would be grateful if anybody out there heard something that was wrong. Right? The area disc at F six point three is tighter than at F ten. But in practice the size of the stars will be determined by seeing conditions more than mechanics. So if we can minimize the, default, the, the following sources of error, optical quality, tracking errors, and guiding, and 
I understand currents in, in the tube as well when it's cooling down <coughs> earlier on in the issue. But uh, if we minimize all of those, and I think the optical quality is good, tracking errors are non-existent pretty much, and, and guiding is, we don't technically need to guide, but we, we are. So we're left with seeing, and if you are seeing limited, then the size of the stars is determined by the focal length and aperture and wavelength of little less in depth, little or less. And there are nights in the Atacama Desert where seeing is outstanding, as opposed to here, where, I mean, do we ever have a, an outstanding night of seeing? I don't know. But outstanding seeing is, is going to happen in the Atacama. So for nights that are not so good, we can just switch over to the road on 135, where it really doesn't matter so much. And we do have, in Picks and Sight these days, we have a secret weapon in the decompilation tool called Blur Experiment. Uh, this is what the Edge HD looks like when you inspect the corners and the center. And I see uh, this is a Centaurus A, uh, one, one of the first uh, shots taken with the uh, do setup, and stars are round in the corner and, and in the center. Um, however, there is um, uh, some fatness to the stars. And that's not surprising, but if you if you apply deconvolution, you can see the difference in uh, in probably the starriest object you're going to point it at, which is a nodular cluster. Um, so uh, I, I think I mentioned this. We have two uh, cameras on the uh, on the pier. One on the pier, sorry, at the base, which is the all sky camera, and then we have another camera, which is a uh, Player one Mars M camera, and it's pointing at the flat panels, and its purpose is to always allow me to have a view of the flat panels, because I noticed in testing that from time to time, if I did something out of sequence, then a, a panel could be out of position, saying it's open more than it's not, or saying it's closed more than it's not. And I need to be able to diagnose those situations. So that's what this camera view is for. But it's also it's also that uh, you know see can you see clouds on the horizon or you know whatever. Like it has multiple uses. And this is the um, all sky camera. This is it now with the the new telescope installed. And and you know the first target I wanted to see how it looked was. Uh, M16. So this is an uh, uh, HA subframe, uh, five minute exposure, and I mean I might have I might have DXT'd it. I can't remember, but that's basically what we got when we first looked at the data. And um, then when I took a full set of data, which is not a lot of data, um, this is one hour each of HA03 and S2. And um, things are looking good. And a couple more shots of, uh, <clears throat> of what we're, we're getting. So while I'm on uh, Centaurus A, uh, Brian reminded me that we looked at Centaurus, Centaurus A in a one meter telescope. And this is, I think it was more magnification in the telescope, wasn't it? Not a lot more, but uh, the detail that we saw in the telescope was quite similar to, imagine that, right? Like you look in a telescope and at this object and, and, and you can see all these dust lanes and stuff. I mean, it's just mind boggling. Uh, M83, and that's uh, 25 by 2 minutes, 15, not quite an hour's worth of uh, uh, data per filter. Um, so with the Rokinon, this is an image taken, this is an image, it's really a four panel mosaic of, um, so with the Rokinon, we're using a one shot color camera with a filter wheel that has um, two filters in it, three really, it has a luminance filter to keep the focus part focal with the, uh, the, the two narrowband filters, so they're dual, uh, filters, 
because one has HANO3, the other has S2 and H beta. And so this is um, an hour of one, uh, the HA filter and an hour of the RGB on each of the four panels. And then I got really crazy and Galan said I was mad. <laughs> and I, I thought, well, I want I, this is what I was looking at with the um, binoculars the whole time I was observing. Um, and I just wanted to recreate it. It was just absolutely amazing. Um, so a 24 panel mosaic, why not? <laughs> and uh, oh here God. is kind of how it turned out. It started off as a 21 panel mosaic and I thought, well, I've cut Ada Karina really close. I better add three more panels, except the, the one panel was not quite uh, aligned well, so I didn't get to use as much of that space as I wanted. But this is, uh, you know, 30 um, two-minute exposures for each panel twice. Once for the uh, one-shot color and then another round of uh, HA. And then I put the two together, cropped it, and once the HA was added. So sort of left to right, we have um, Alpha Centauri is the white, uh, yellow, I guess, star, uh, Beta Centauri, the blue star. Colsac is this area here. Um, the Rang Chicken Nebula, Eta Carina, uh, the Southern Pleiades, that, and this thing called the Dark Doodad, the official term. Down at the bottom, right there, and um, there are just—I it, mean, it's, a, it's an uh, amazingly rich uh, region for binoculars and uh, telescopes, or or just lying on your back and just staring at it. It's just unbelievable. So these are images from the Tech 140 of these targets. So they're Beta Carina, NGC 3352, which is a beautiful cluster. Uh, 3324 and the running chicken <coughs> and the southern Pleiades <coughs> the dark doodad. And Jarius, the next one's for you. Tell me if you recognize this. Okay. Yeah? Well, the two. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. So you had a hand in making this, correct? Yeah, I helped put it together. Just so assembly. Just assembly. Just the assembly? Yeah. And uh, I believe I also worked on the, uh, the uh, secondary holder. Yeah. Okay. So um, I guess Bob Sanis has moved on from this instrument, and it's in the hands of the land now. And um, this is being upgraded to a three inch focuser. Okay. And uh, so it's uh, it's still being used, and it's still loved, and it's. it's uh, it's going to have uh, a new purpose once it's been uh, up there. I remember correctly, that's a 16 inch? I think so. I am not positive. <coughs> may have also done the gear software. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so uh, just for perspective, this is uh, the, let's call it the northwest corner of the observatory, and our telescope is probably about here. Okay. So when, when I walked in, as soon as I saw it, I recognized it. Okay. So as was mentioned, we were uh, we were down there um, at the uh, at the moment the, uh, the CME hit, and Andreas's wonderful imagery of the aurora uh, wowed everybody. And um, I was aware the CME was coming. You know, I, I was with all of you in that you know anticipating it and not knowing where I was going to what it was going to look like. Um, so I did start, the, I, I had it in the back of my mind that I might try to, to capture, uh, as, 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 as ridiculous as it seemed, I thought I should just run my camera, so I did. And now you have to, I'm going to tell you where to look, because it does, it's not, it's not a long appearance, but it's basically around this area, or for people on the side of and you can only see those because they're sort of a great wall there. Okay. 
So the problem is that there was no green on it. Or it's it's too far away. Yeah. Um, so I mean, I I was thinking about this. I mean, it's kind of interesting. Now I've seen the aurora borealis and the aurora australis. So that's kind of neat. <coughs> um, the 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 glow. There was something in the air. In fact, I can't say that I saw it naked eye, like hundred percent. But it, there was a hint. I would say, and uh, that's probably that's partly why Alan took this photo because I think he. He could see it too. We weren't in the same location at the time, but this this instrument, this photograph, doesn't do it justice. So, I mean, if you look at the ladder, I think that's a fourteen foot ladder. I think. But if you look at this telescope. Uh, all he had to do was have his wife stand here, and she would be like, like her head would be like here, like. Uh, it, it is just absolutely ginormous. It must weigh a ton. Uh, it's Probably a, uh, several. Yeah. So the, the whole base rotates this way. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then you can see the rails. He has a roll on building. Okay. So when he parks it, it's straight up and then the building rolls on? I can't remember. But yeah, the building rolls. So it would it would be in a, it would, a it correct would, orientation. It would be parked in the, in the upright position? <laughs> no, he doesn't park it quite vertical. Building is big enough that he, he, he parks it at a bit of an angle. Okay. Yeah. Do, do, do people remember Steve Dotson? How many people remember Steve Dotson? Do you remember his 22 inch? Hmm. Where he had to, what he did for, for his, his ladder, instead of having something like that, it was basically an extension ladder with two legs coming out. And so you were standing about, I'd say, 50 feet from the air, you get to the eye piece. Nice. No. Did he take that to start on? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, he had it, it was trailer mounted. It was an epoxy platform. So it was <coughs> and then what he would do is the mirror would come out, and sometimes he would sleep in 70 feet of the telescope. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that reminds me that the Hamilton Center now has the telescope that was in, in uh, Attila's yes. arsenal. Yep. And that's going to start. That's this year. Yeah. Well. Ooh. So I, I did another um, camera angle. Now this is pointing east, and the oh. purpose of this shot, I, I set the camera up and it was running automatically. Mm -hmm. I was, just, I didn't. See. So the um, this is the night of the aurora. The zodiacal light. That is the zodiacal light, and I, I cannot state. That I know for one way or the other that's Aurora. It could be air glow or whatever sky glow. I, I it could, it, but it, it sure does. I mean, and I'm pointing east, so it it, it it's too far north for it to be Aurora. Did but, you take multiple photos? Yeah. Are there, is there any motion? No. Not really. So pretty good. Picture. And, uh, you know, there's the end of another night and, and everything's working great. And um, that's, that's the end of the, the report. Now, there is one more thing. Um, we, um, as I mentioned, uh, Gillan is here. And um, we've had uh, great um, assistance from Brian. And um, Gillan, do you want to come up? Sure. And, uh, this one, I don't have any elaborate presentation, and after seeing <coughs> Andrea's uh, contraption and, and the cheese grater that Brian brought, I think I'm going to stop building the stuff. And I just just going to admire what everybody else is doing. I think it's awesome. So first of all, Brian, uh, so you started your presentation by saying you were lending a helping hand, but I just want to make sure that you made it through Chile and, and you did help Malta, and you weren't put in jail with your bomb contraction, right? <laughs> okay, cool. So, so I'm here today basically to just, uh, I brought you a little, uh, little gift, a little astronomy gear that you can hopefully use in, in, in your contraption, in your setup and whatnot as a token of my appreciation for being on the ground. I haven't been there like 
probably five years in 2019 when, when we all went. And uh, I, I still cherish the, 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 uh, at the dinner the, the contraption that he made for us. I, I, and I did share a picture with, uh, with Malcolm uh, a couple of weeks ago as well. So uh, I wish I was there. I wasn't there, but you were there for me. And uh, if you want to come in, uh, come over. I just uh, a little, uh, yeah, cool thing for you to, to use. It, it's all astronomy related. Hopefully, okay. it's gear that you can use at some point in time. <laughs> this is not necessary. I, I assure you, it's not necessary because it's much fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it, it was. It was. I, I, I mentioned this to, to Malcolm when we were driving from Kalama to to San Pedro, and I felt like I was going home. You know, like wow. it, it's it's really weird to be that far away. And, and feeling, you know, th this, this is kind of where I belong. And it, it, I encourage any of you, if, if, if you're contemplating an astronomy trip, you could do nothing better than go and visit Alain in San Pedro de Atacama. It, that, that, I can absolutely guarantee it will stay with you forever. Mm -hmm. just, just being there, meeting Alain, seeing the, the stuff he's got there. It, it's just wonderful, and 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 thanks to both of you. I've I've enjoyed working with you, and, and it's been great fun. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. And in the telescope that you just showed, I think the panel was building it when we were there in 2019. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, it was. I want uh, something else that just popped into mind. Talk about going home. When I didn't know this, but Malcolm did. The lodge next to us was occupied by Rajiv Gupta. And many of oh. you know Rashi from his many, day, many, many contributions to the RESC. Mm -hmm. You know, talk about going home. Here's, here's, here's. I've only met Raji three times, <laughs> three times in Chile. <laughs> so it, it's hopes. And thank you. Okay. I believe that. Uh, for the meeting tonight. Thanks everybody for coming. Hope you enjoyed the meeting. Um, look in your, remember to watch out for an email from our secretary. There's going to be an announcement about a Zoom meeting to uh, consider and vote on the acceptance of the bylaws. And that should be a meeting sometime in July. How are you going to send it out? There will be an email. No, but I mean, like the last one you sent out for this meeting? Um, I won't be doing that. <laughs> oh, okay, no, I just, I didn't get it, so I don't know what, what's going on. But yeah, I'm trying to get it. So, yeah. But that's it. <laughs>